Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Visionaries documentary premiere event about research at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. So to begin, I'll introduce myself. I'm Mitch Cronenberg, the president of the La Jolla Institute. And I'd like to give you some background about the Institute, about Visionaries, and about our senior producer, Ms. Jody Santos. So first, La Jolla Institute for Immunology. We're a 32-year-old organization dedicated to make great discoveries about the immune system to, uh, that will positively influence human health. Uh, we are almost 500 employees, a budget of approximately $70 million a year. And uh, we're happy to be working here in San Diego. Our research on the immune system is really directed in three areas. One are the chronic inflammatory and autoimmune diseases that are increasing around the world, diseases like diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and others. A second area is cancer and cancer immune therapy. And using the immune system to fight cancer has been increasing lately and is the latest uh, tool in our toolbox for fighting cancer. It can be very effective. And the third area is infectious disease and vaccine development. And it's the area that we're going to hear more about tonight. Because we are so effective at vaccine and infectious disease research, we've been able to rapidly become one of the leading research organizations in the world studying SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 disease that it causes. But in our view, uh, immunology, a beautiful discipline, is all interconnected. And I want to emphasize that someone doing research, for example, on cancer immunotherapy may make a discovery that's very important for vaccine development or for treating inflammatory diseases. Before telling you about the visionary series, I want to thank those donors who've already stepped up to support our COVID-19 research efforts. And those who've also supported us in making this visionaries documentary, particularly the Charton family, uh, who include our board member, Chris Charton. Now, a little bit about the visionaries. The visionary documentary series highlights the rarely told stories of individuals and nonprofit organizations that are working to create positive social change throughout the world. Visionaries have produced over 230 documentaries shot in 65 countries. And they've been aired on PBS stations throughout the nation for 23 years. For tonight's program, our senior producer is Jody Santos, who will be speaking to you shortly. Jody is a human rights filmmaker who has traveled to some 30 countries documenting everything from the trafficking of girls in Nepal to the widespread and often abusive practice of institutionalizing children with disabilities. Jody's documentaries have appeared on public television and on cable networks such as the Discovery Channel. And she also teaches video production and documentary filmmaking at Northeastern University School of Journalism in Boston, Massachusetts. So Jody and her team are responsible for this visionaries project. I'd like to turn it over to Jody now. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much, Dr. Cronenberg. I really do appreciate it. And I uh, so appreciate everyone being here tonight. Um, similar to other major events in history, I'm sure many of you will remember where you were when you realized that COVID-19 was here to stay and that we wouldn't be going back to normal anytime soon. For me, that day was Friday, March 6th. The La Jolla Institute's Dr. Susan Tressa and I were supposed to be flying to Nepal in a few weeks to film some of the episode that you're about to watch. But on that Friday, we decided to pull the plug. We'd been going back and forth on whether it was safe to travel, and my cinematographer, Ben pender Cudlip had already backed out of the trip. His wife was having a baby in a few months, and he worried that some arbitrary travel ban related to the pandemic would prevent him from getting back into the country if his wife went into labor early. But Dr. Shrester was determined to go, and I was torn. This was what I'd been training for my entire career as a journalist and a filmmaker. There was a major outbreak, and I would be traveling to Nepal with Dr. Shrestha, a world-renowned infectious disease specialist. 
Ultimately, though, the decision of whether to go was made for us when our children's schools issued advisories saying that anybody traveling to Asia had to quarantine themselves and their kids for two weeks when they returned. That was it. We were willing to take the risk ourselves, but once our kids' schools got involved, all bets were off. But I must say that not going to Nepal had its benefits when it came to this episode. Rather than looking outward and traveling abroad, I really had to look much more closely at the inner lives and motivations of my interview subject. How could these scientists, Dr. Erica Ullman Sapphire, Dr. Shane Crotty, Dr. Shrestha, and of course, Dr. Cronenberg, go forward day after day when, as Dr. Crotty said in the film, nine out of 10 of our experiments will fail. As I learned, for these scientists, the answer is simple, a passion for what they do and complete faith that their work will lead to life-saving treatments for the diseases they study. I remember Dr. Sapphire telling me that new technology now allows her to see viruses like corona on a molecular level, and that this is the roadmap we need to defeat the virus. It's only a matter of time. Those words come back to me on days when I wonder whether we'll ever be free of this pandemic. I just tell myself, Eric is on it. For those of you wondering about Ben, my cinematographer who had to back out of the trip because his wife was having a baby, Elliot Pender Gleason was born on July 31st, weighing seven pounds, six ounces. Mom, dad, and baby are doing well. The name of this film is Life Without Disease, and as some of you know, I wasn't sure if I could be here tonight because my dad is in the hospital. At 87 years old, he struggled with type 1 diabetes for nearly five decades and was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's. My family has known disease. But thanks to the amazing work of the La Jolla Institute, I'm hopeful that Elliot and his family will know less of it. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Let's roll the film. Visionaries is proud to present its 24th season on public television. One of the great wonders of science is the window it has opened into the microscopic world. There, inside all living things, an epic struggle is always underway. Bacteria invade the land, viruses scale the gates, and cancers claim territory. It's epic. And as such, there are valiant, heroic defenders of the realm of the living, our immune systems. Here is where the story gets interesting. Our heroes have a secret weapon. It's called science. Imagine if we could decode the immune system to unlock new preventions and treatments for some of the world's most devastating diseases. Imagine a life expectancy of 125 years or more with no sick days, not even one doctor's visit or day spent in a hospital. This is La Jolla Institute for Immunology's mission in a nutshell. Every day, its researchers work towards making discoveries of new weapons in the epic struggle against disease that will lead to better defenses and ultimately cures for immune system related diseases. The immune system touches almost every disease. It's hard to find a disease or a condition that's not affected by the immune system. Why is that? The reason is that your immune cells are everywhere in the body. Some of them are circulating and patrolling everywhere, and others are actually resident in your kidney and your intestine. There are immune cells that reside there and contribute to the overall tone of the tissue or function of the tissue, as well as fighting infection. The work here, we divide into three categories. There's infectious disease, which is very important, and vaccines, which are the most effective public health measures. But we also work on cancer, and stimulating the immune response to fight cancer 
has become a burgeoning area of new therapies that are less toxic and in many cases more effective. And also equally important is learning how to turn down those inappropriate immune responses, particularly in the more than 80 autoimmune diseases, some of which attack particular tissues, type 1 diabetes, for example, the pancreas. Our mission is to make fundamental, great discoveries on how the immune system works to the benefit of human health. And therefore, we've adopted a motto, life without disease, which is a direction. When you first hear it, it makes you think, which is good, because presumably there will always be some diseases, but we can have life without polio or life without smallpox. We've reached that already. Why not have life without HIV, AIDS, or life without malaria, or life without tuberculosis. This structure is from X-ray crystallography. Immunology is a beautiful and complex science. It's the science of understanding how your body can heal itself how every day it detects and destroys invaders before you ever know you've been infected, and how it detects and destroys cancer cells before they ever take hold. And this one's the light chain, and that one's the heavy chain. Is there more contact with the light chain? And, the and you can study immunology and when it goes right and when it goes wrong on multiple different levels. You can study it at a population level, how we develop herd immunity and how we develop or don't develop diseases. You can study it at a whole human level, how this one human has conquered an autoimmune disease or how this one human has fought off an infection and become immune. You can study it at the cellular level. I study it at the far extreme, the molecular level. Viruses are at an intellectual level fascinating because they can be so simple. So you and I have 20,000 genes in our human genome, and that makes 20,000 molecules for 20,000 functions. But these viruses are incredibly simple. Ebola virus has just seven genes. The fever, four. Exactly four. So it makes four different molecules. It's a machine with four working parts. And so one question is, how can something so simple be so pathogenic and so deadly, and how come our much more complex selves and our human intellect are powerless against this tiny, simple thing? But on the other hand, if the machine is that simple, we can take it apart and we can examine it. And there are vulnerabilities there, and that's exactly what we've been able to do. What we're using here is not microscope, but microscope. It's, the one we use is 11 feet tall and it has a massive and incredibly powerful beam of electrons operating at 300 kilovolts, focusing incredible illumination on a very small biological sample. And it has sophisticated electronics that allow all of those electron beams to be aligned and refined to get the perfect image. been able to understand how these very few molecules are folded up and how they work. We can see where they change and where they can't, and we can see exactly the shape that no one has ever seen before. We had developed a body of work where we finally cracked the structures of the key molecules of Ebola virus, Marburg virus, Lassa virus. And the field now, for the first time, has life-saving therapeutics against Ebola virus. It's not hopeless. The most powerful microscopes commercially available are focused here at La Jolla Institute on coronavirus to understand the molecular nature of the atomic bonding by which that virus is built. If we can see it at that level, that is the complete roadmap that we need to understand how to defeat it.
the Coronavirus Immunotherapeutic Consortium is designed to unite all of the antibody discovery labs around the world to figure out which of the antibodies we are all making are the most potent against the virus, which ones should be delivered as a drug. And this is important because even once there is a vaccine, it's not going to be in all places at all times. There will be people that haven't yet been vaccinated. There are people that can't be vaccinated. We need to protect people while we're waiting for that vaccine. If we can find antibodies, we can give them as immediate and safe drugs for protection. But we got to find which ones are best. So this is our beacon instrument, which allows us to look at immune cells that make uh, molecules called antibodies, which precisely target particular sites on our pathogens of interest. So what this instrument does is identify where individual immune cells are located on this little chip, puts a light box around it, and moves that cell into these holding pens. Now you can see it uh, shifting this one single cell now out of the pen and it'll put it into this little channel and then uh, export that cell into a plate where we can uh, grow it or isolate the, the DNA that has created that antibody. Our goal is to make sure that no one is priced out of these therapies, to look among the ones that are being discovered, to figure out which are the most potent, which ones are the most scalable, to make sure that we can deliver immune protection broadly around the world because this virus anywhere ultimately becomes this virus everywhere. I'm obsessed with vaccine immunology. Vaccines are extraordinary medicines. Um, vaccines are probably the only medicine uh, that's recommended for every healthy person on the planet, right? That's, that's something special to be able to say. Uh, and they've just saved really extraordinary numbers of, of lives. And in general, it's, it's not even noticed, right? Because you give vaccines to a healthy person and it keeps them from getting sick. So you never see the sickness at all. The, the measles vaccine alone has saved 14 million lives in the past 10 years. That's an incredible number. And that's just one of the 26 or 28 vaccines. It would be fantastic if we could have more vaccines that could do those, those types of things for, uh, for improving human health. It's easy to think that, well, we've, we've made um, at least a couple dozen vaccines against a variety of things, so you know, why, why isn't it easy to just keep making vaccines to other things? Many of those vaccines were developed before we understood much science, and certainly before we understood the immune system. Um, I would say most of our understanding of the immune system has come since 1950. Most vaccines were actually developed before 1950. And so vaccine development grew as a very empirical trial and error field. The classic way to try a vaccine is you have, somebody has an idea about what um, particle, what, what, what thing they want to try as a vaccine. And essentially, you try it and it either works or it fails. It's basically, it's an all or nothing, okay? And if it works, great, that's a huge success. But if it fails, you've really learned nothing. <laughs> um, it's, it's just empirical, there's nothing to build on. Um, and so we really want it to be much more of an engineering problem, right? Where you, you can try something and you can fail, but you can learn from that failure. Over the past 30 years, we've learned an extraordinary amount about the immune system, you know, all the way from, from genes and proteins involved to the many, many different cell types involved. And so my big focus, how can we really connect all this knowledge we have about immunology with, with vaccine development? One thing that a whole bunch of labs are trying to do uh, right now with coronavirus is say, well, okay, probably people who are getting sick but recovering are making really good antibody responses. And so if we know what those antibodies are binding on coronavirus and what they're doing to coronavirus, uh, that should accelerate vaccine development because that gives you something to focus on. What's the right target? 
the more we know about that, the more likely it is that somebody can, uh, can make a vaccine that can mimic that. You want to take someone who was infected with coronavirus but got better and take B cells from that person and find the right B cell that's actually able to kill coronavirus with, uh, with antibody. We want to understand what are the underlying rules or principles of the immune system that control a good response to a, to a vaccine. The guiding principle of the lab is really we go after whatever we think the toughest problem is or wherever the biggest bottleneck is in, in the understanding and yeah, try and answer that so that the whole field can move forward uh, for, for studying, again, many different vaccines. I study dengue and Zika viruses, and the number one question we're trying to address is how does the immune system try to contain these virus infections and um, not cause disease? Because the immune system is involved in not only protecting against these virus infection, but under certain circumstances, it can actually contribute to, for the people coming down with severe manifestations of dengue infection or Zika infection. Oh, this is Dakar. And this is Dakar. I was born and raised in Nepal. Then I came to the United States when I was 12 so that I could get um, all my higher education done in a Western country. In this machine, you can see how many... I consider myself Nepali American. How many is the virus to really infect in the cells? I wanted to do something that would help globally, not just the U.S. and the Western world, but also that part of the world. Uh, what is the real infection for Zika virus in BSK cells? So when, when I entered my postdoctoral um, phase, I decided instead of focusing just on immunology, I wanted to branch out and venture into diseases that really affected that part of the world. Nepal has a huge burden of these diseases that really impacts the people in multiple ways, economic, well-being. So that's when I decided to do a postdoctoral fellowship on virology, starting with the dengue viruses. And that's how I entered the field of this, what we call the flaviviruses, which includes dengue viruses, Zika viruses, West Nile viruses, Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever. So did you have a dengue uh, uh, control too? Or just... Yeah, we have dengue control too, LPS control. Traditionally in our field, the focus has been on antibodies. What our work is showing is that in addition to antibodies, T cells are really important. On top of that, our work is also showing that antibodies under certain conditions can also play a bad role. And in case the antibodies are not good enough to protect, or in certain circumstances are actually bad and cause the severe manifestations, then the T cells are there to protect. And based on our work, we're saying, okay, let's develop a vaccine that induces both antibody responses and T cell responses. Oh, wow. It worked? Yes. <laughs> so, Less activation. There are so few labs who do T cell studies, and now we're moving from mouse T cell response to she's now the first one in my lab to look at the human T cell responses. But she's telling me this is the first time where we our hypothesis was that based on some other studies, the Zika infected cells are not very good at stimulating, activating T cells, and that's what she's seeing. And this has really tremendous implications for how diseases occur, occur in these humans and how we should go about in terms of vaccine development. Since the emergence of Zika in 2016, um, we're one of the first labs to show that the immune responses to these viruses are highly cross-reactive. What that means is that both antibody and T cell responses to, this, to dengue can recognize Zika and vice versa. 
So now what we're trying to do is like, okay, based on the immunology that we're learning about these cross-reactive immune responses, it no longer makes sense to develop a vaccine just against dengue, just against Zika. Because if you develop an, a vaccine against one of these viruses, that vaccine induce response, immune response against one virus, yeah, it could protect, or it could actually enhance the severity of infection with this related viruses. So this dengue, is Zika, West Nile viruses, these are highly closely related. Uh, IO2 and also the IO10 for three-day pulse. So one thing we're super excited about doing in the lab is in terms of tackling this global problem with the both dengue and Zika, we want to be developing what we're calling a universal dengue Zika or a pan flavivirus vaccine. Criticism of Dengue is considered the top 10 health problems in the world. It impacts almost half the world population, more than 100 countries. The incidence of dengue infection, dengue diseases, um, it has gone up 30-fold in the past 50 years. And that's because these viruses, dengue and Zika, they're transmitted by mosquitoes. And because of massive globalization, urbanization, climate change, these mosquitoes are now moving into areas where they normally were not before. In countries like Nepal, where you would never think a Himalayan country should have dengue, but now we do have major problems with dengue because these mosquitoes have moved from subtropical, tropical regions of the world into these temperate zones to like, okay, can you like, in, you know, generate these figures that we need for the paper? So hopefully when... This is the humanitarian aspect of my research. It's not just pure science, which is, yes, we need to be doing so sophisticated scientific research it's in labs right here in the U.S., in La Jolla Institute. But my approach is we need to be doing this kind of research in countries like Nepal, like India, and use the local knowledge, local capacity to strengthen this global effort so that scientists in countries like Nepal know how to contain this virus infection. Australia? Yes. So that we don't have to deal with these new emerging infectious diseases coming out of these countries into Western world in North America and right here in San Diego. So my take is we want to be developing research infrastructure in countries like Nepal. Resources is very limited in Nepal, so uh, the resources is the one of the uh, most uh, challenged part, and then the skills uh, uh, that meet the, the standard, international standard of the research work is one of the challenges that should be uh, met by uh, the department. Uh, uh, we have 240 uh, samples for mice collected, not for this. I was very excited when Krishna contacted me because being the one of the biggest universities in the entire nation that means we have you know we're working with all these young students so and this is what we need is we need to be collaborating with these universities with professors students so that we're changing the whole generation and training them uh, as easy as you think to grow these viruses so don't be frustrated when it, it should be equal partnership and we need local knowledge here i'm here in this country in san diego if there's an epidemic of dengue in Kathmandu, you know ward number 52 but not in 53 you know the the, the ecological niche the dynamics the mosquitoes the human cultural practices you know i i may not be knowing what's going on that that's that could explain how these mosquitoes are transmitting these viruses. Science benefits if you have diverse opinions, people from different ethnic groups, different backgrounds joining in and tackling the same problem. And actually, that actually helps the science move forward. We are doing the last step of the ELISA. We want to reveal the presence of antibody. Uh, I'm calling for a global effort that is more equitable and fair than um, 
what's the current standard now. You could say that it's an exercise in delayed gratification to be a scientist. On the other hand, if we think in terms of not the next six months, yeah, my iPhone in three years, I throw it away, well, whatever I do with it, and I want another one. But um, if you think of a, a effective new treatment for a disease, that can be, that can be generations. And, and lifetimes. The impact of the polio vaccine, how do you compare that to, you know, 5G? So, yeah, I think we have to take a, a, a little bit longer view than what's going to happen in two or three years. I do think we can achieve life without many of these diseases. And by putting the right people and the right skill sets and the right tools, to focus on those problems, we could achieve life without Ebola, life without malaria, life without Lhasa, life without dengue. We can, by visualizing what the virus is and where it's vulnerable and what an effective immune response might be, discover and deliver those vaccines and therapeutics for broad protection. And we can do it more rapidly than we ever could before. Nine out of 10 of our experiments will fail. Like that, uh, like we're gonna try a bunch of ideas and if we're failing 90% of the time, we still might be doing fine. You know, if, if that 10% shows us the, the right step for the next direction, um, that, that's kind of where we operate. So yeah, you, you know, you, you gotta be, you gotta be passionate about it because you're failing 90% of the time, right? You gotta have something that's gonna get you out of the bed in the morning. and, and and that is, yeah, vaccines are, are the most effective medicine on the planet. Anything that, that we could do to, to possibly make a new one, you know, is absolutely worth it. Life without disease. What would that look like for you? At La Jolla Institute, researchers are working toward making that a reality for all of us. For the visionaries, I am Sam Waters. through the generosity of William Reinsold Trust, George and Judy Marcus Family Foundation, Liquid Net, the Carson Family Charitable Trust, Sanofi Pasteur, the Wallace Foundation, the City Fund, Walton Family Foundation, R.J. Hedges and Associates, Berkeley Lights, La Crosse and Blue Shield of Minnesota Foundation, Cabot Keller of Realty Trust, Rodman W. Moorhead III, Lessing Stern of 1080, the John Lazarich Foundation, John Paul Mitchell Systems, Moxie Foundation, Fenton Alexander Lee, Jay Gerwin Foundation, the Lenfis Legacy Fund, and Thermo Fisher Scientific, as well as Orange County Community Foundation, Pfizer, Fernandez Pave the Way Foundation, the Dolphinger McMahon Foundation, American Reading Company, Ballard Spar, BD Medical Pharmaceutical Systems, Diana and Khaled Nipsa, FR Bigelow Foundation, Fake Reed Drinker Biddle Henry, Francis Moran Abbott, Gerard Foundation, Hanekman Foundation, St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation, and Susan and Thomas Stone, with additional support by the following. So I'd like to welcome everybody back and introduce our panelists, although in some ways they need no discussion, uh, no introductions because you've just met them. Uh, 
First, uh, Dr. Mitch Cronenberg, who's the President and Chief Scientific Officer at La Jolla Institute. Dr. Cronenberg is an internationally recognized scientist and one of the most highly cited immunologists in the world. This distinction is held by less than one half of 1% of all publishing scientific authors. In September 2003, Dr. Cronenberg was appointed President of La Jolla Institute for Immunology. In addition to his executive duties, he, has, he serves as chief scientific officer and conducts an active research program. Next, Dr. Shane Crody, who is a professor at LJI. Dr. Crody joined the faculty in 2003. The goal of Shane's lab is to understand factors that cause the development of long-lasting antibody responses and to harness that knowledge for vaccine design. A focus of Shane's work has been to build the fundamental immunology knowledge needed for rational vaccine design. Next, we have Dr. Erica Ullman Sapphire, who is also a professor at LJI. Dr. Sapphire joined the faculty in February of 2019. Erica is also director of COVIC, a Gates Foundation funded effort to understand and deliver antibody therapeutics against SARS-CoV-2 to ensure that no one is priced out of life-saving therapy. Her research combines structural biology with cellular virology and immunology. And finally, we have Dr. Susan Shrestha, another professor at LJI. Dr. Shrestha joined the faculty in 2005. A primary goal of Susan's laboratory is to understand the mechanisms of pathogenesis and immunity for dengue virus and Zika virus. These are the most important mosquito-borne viral diseases in humans. So we encourage you to send in your questions, but while we're waiting for them, I'm going to kick it off uh, with a question to Dr. Cronenberg. Um, Dr. Cronenberg, you know, most of the filming for this episode took place in late January, right after the first case of COVID had been confirmed in the US. What went through your mind back then? And did you think that COVID would become the global pandemic that it is now? Well, I would like to claim that I was very prescient, but I wasn't. Um, SARS came in 2003, SARS-CoV-1, if you will, and it disappeared. And I was aware that influenza can kill 60,000 or more people in the U.S. in a bad year. And I, I, I have to admit, I had the idea, this is just, you know, a bad flu, perhaps. But this virus um, has surprised us. It, uh, it can be... Uh, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic for periods of time. It's a respiratory virus that causes the loss of, uh, of smell and taste and can cause kidney and heart problems. Uh, and it, um, it can confound us in other ways, causing rarely, but causing extreme inflammatory conditions in children. So um, it's much, much worse than I thought it would be, but you have to listen to the facts and adjust your view accordingly. This is a very serious problem. Thanks for your question. Absolutely. Shane, you've been thinking about vaccines and how the immune system responds to vaccines for most of your scientific career. Did you ever anticipate your research would become so urgent? I, I did actually, although like Mitch, there was no, uh, I definitely cannot claim to be uh, prescient about uh, about SARS too. Um, definitely, the the general bet was that it was going to be some form of flu that would be the uh, the next pandemic. But but there there's there's clearly been a history of of, of pandemics um, over the past uh, century and more, um, both both human and non-human. And so there really was the expectation in in public health circles and in virology circles that there would be. Um, another pandemic at, at, at some point and, and that we would need to be as, as prepared as possible for it. And, and in all scenarios, uh, people considered a, a vaccine would be, would be a big part of that. But knowing that vaccines are generally relatively slow to develop and so um, what types of things could be accelerated about vaccine development you know, to, to make responses to a new pandemic uh, faster. And, and, and part of that uh, has well several parts of that have, have come true. I mean, it's it's been incredible how much scientific progress there's been on on, on this novel coronavirus just in a few months, uh, including understanding the human immune response to it, which is normally one of the keys for developing a good vaccine is is understanding how how people are normally responding to the virus and how to do something that good or better with a vaccine. Good. 
Thank you. And Erica, you are running COVID, which is looking for the best antibodies to treat people with COVID. How is that different from treating people with plasma from individuals who have already recovered from the disease? Great question. So this week we heard about FDA approving use of convalescent plasma. And so that is blood pulled right from a person who has survived SARS-CoV-2. You spin out the red and white blood cells and you're left with the yellow fluid that has all of their antibodies. Now in that array of antibodies, there are billions. And there are antibodies against the chicken pox they had when they are a kid. They're the antibodies against the flu they had last year and everything they've ever had. And there's some against what they most recently had, the SARS-CoV-2. But among that ray of antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, there are some that are very potent and there are some that are duds. So that's quite variable. Some people make a very strong response. Some people make a very weak response. But it's a great start. It's some antibodies which could reduce the amount of virus and help protect a person, keep them in a mild state of disease. So the difference between that and what we're doing this global consortium as we're looking in those billions of antibodies and finding just the one or two very, very best, the two needles in that haystack that are the most potent and most precise against that virus, and we are manufacturing them at greater level and greater scale. So you get all of the most potent molecules and none of the duds. So it's a very precise, very well understood therapy. And I have a lot of hope that these are going to work. The, the theory is much like anti-venom. After a snake bite, anti-venom, that's antibody, which immediately finds, neutralizes, and inactivates that snake toxin. So earlier is better, and it's a life-saving thing. Great. Thank you, Erica. And Susan, COVID-19 has hit different countries very hard, while others seem less affected. What do we know about how different populations respond to the virus? Another great question. Um, we don't have precise data, but the emerging observations suggest that there are certain countries, certain continents, like, um, places in South Asia, including India, and many countries in Africa, they have significant numbers, high numbers of these CoV-2 infections, but it seems like the incidence of severe disease is not that high as compared to Western Europe or the, or the, or the United States. And we think that's a really, really important observation and that should be followed up. And the reason for that is we think the immune system, as you've heard in this documentary, plays a major role in response to this virus infection. And we think the immune system holds the key to determining why certain people come down with mild disease and some certain people come down with severe disease. And what's really interesting about the immune system is it's shaped by multiple factors. Genetics is important. So is the environment. So you can imagine, when you saw the clips of Nepal, countries like Nepal, the environment is completely different from here, right here in San Diego. Uh, in particular, the immune system is heavily shaped by prior exposure to different infectious diseases. So these countries in Africa and South Asia, people are exposed to a variety of infectious diseases, not just the past coronaviruses, but other, including parasitic worms that people in the US and in Europe were not really infected. And we know those prior infections modulate, it shapes your immune system. And we think that might help give us, provide really important clues by studying how cov 2 infection, uh, how, how this virus interacts with the immune system in different populations. So this is one of the motivation that is leading our research to try to understand what we call this dance between the virus and the host immune system in Nepal and in different countries uh, worldwide. Great. Thanks, Susan. We are getting a lot of questions, um, understandably, about a vaccine for COVID-19. So I'm going to um, start with Shane on this one. A uh, question from the audience. What is the reality of creating a vaccine for COVID-19 before the end of the year? Or when do you think there will be a vaccine? Yeah, obviously, really important questions, big ones. So the... Um... So most smart immunologists and vaccine scientists are avoiding answering that question because um, it's, 
it's basically well known with vaccines. The vaccines are hard to develop, and, and really the, the key test is the efficacy test, which is, which is what are called the, the phase three clinical trials. Um, and so those clinical trials are just, just starting, okay? Um, uh, my, my glass half full answer um, is, consists of a couple of parts, okay? That, that, that I think there actually are a bunch of encouraging signs that at least um, vaccines have a chance of working before the end of the year, where it was definitely possible that there would be knowledge that was gained over the past several months that would indicate um, there really wasn't much of a chance of a vaccine for a long time. I don't think that's the case. I, I do think it's reasonable to look um, glass half full, and there are a couple of quick reasons for that. Um, one is, actually, when we at LJI, my lab, and Alex Setti's lab together looked at what the human immune response looks like in an average case of COVID-19, we, we use that information as a benchmark for um, does it look like people make a decent immune response and how hard might it be to protect against this disease? And, and in general, the signs were good. It, it looked like in an average case that is, you know, flu-like symptoms case, people made, uh, to put it simply, a, a nice looking immune response and it didn't look like an epic response to, to the virus. Uh, second, really protection models in monkeys have indicated it's not that hard to protect against this virus in terms of protecting against disease. Uh, uh, and third, a series of these vaccines, the human vaccines that have gone through the initial human trials, which are called phase one and phase two, um, they, they've jumped through the hoops that they've needed to jump through. They've, they've been safe and they've elicited uh, significant immune responses that look like they have the potential for protective immunity. So actually one of the things I'm most enthusiastic about is that there are actually a number of different vaccine strategies that are all going forward, they, that all look good enough to go forward into these phase three efficacy trials so that they're gonna be something like you know five or six shots on goal before the end of the year, five or six different chances for different vaccines um, to potentially succeed at, at protection. I think the managing expectations view of that is the hope is that there's some evidence of protective immunity, you know, and not necessarily perfect, but at least one of these uh, does something. Um, <clears throat> I'd say that the highest bar that there really isn't data for yet is, um, it's clear that COVID-19 hits the elderly the, the worst. And it's also well known um, that a number of vaccines work better in, in people under the age of 65 than in people over the age of 65. And so that's a very real uh, issue um, that'll have to be examined on top of that. And uh, yeah, we're gonna try and help people look at that. And Erica is gonna help uh, look at that in the vaccine trial. So uh, LJIs, uh, really involved in these issues, we, we don't sleep a whole lot. <laughs> but it sounds like maybe we're further along than you thought we might be at this point. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, we're 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 thirty years into looking for an HIV vaccine, and there's there's not going to be one in the next five years for sure. So to be going from, I mean, I know for everybody, twenty twenty feels like it's been thirty years long, but it's you know, it's only been. It's August, it's August, so that's what, eight months. Um, so, I mean, absolutely extraordinary progress uh, in, 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 in science in general, in the virology, in the immunology, and in the vaccine development. There's never been anything even remotely close to the speed and success so far um, that, that's occurred for uh, the scientific efforts against SARS-2. But yeah, I mean, we have to keep it up because you, you're not at the finish line until you're at the finish line. Um, and, and anybody who says, um, they don't have faith that there's going to be a vaccine until they see phase three results. It's absolutely right to say so. I'm just. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay. I got a question for Erica here. Um, since COVID-19, it seems every journalist has an immunologist or virologist on speed dial to help them make sense of the latest research. How does it feel to be suddenly thrown into the limelight? Well, it's, why we go to work in the morning. We go to work in the morning to make a difference for human health. This is why we try the nine things out of 10, if not 999 out of 1,000. And we, Sujan and I and others, we have a lot of experience working on different viral pandemics. We were in the middle of Ebola virus. We were mobilizing and trying to understand what the right therapeutics would be. In the middle of Lhasa outbreaks, we're doing that. Sujan has been on the ground with different outbreaks in different places. This is 
this is what inspires us. This is what we train to do. This is our calling. And communication of scientific information is more critical than ever. If people want to come out of their houses, go back to school, go back to work, see their grandkids, live till next year, Americans are, and people around the world are now keenly interested in, well, how does a vaccine work? How do you know if it works? What is immune memory? What is a B cell? What is a T cell? Which do you need? Do you need them both? I mean, these are not just ivory tower academic questions. They're true matters of human endeavor and our progress to get from this point into next year and get back to normal. It's, it's fundamentally important for everything we are and everything we do. Um, I remember when I interviewed you and just how much you tried to boil down your research in, in ways that anybody could understand and how you would think about the question beforehand and the person who was transcribing your interview later said, I don't think I've ever seen such a brilliant interview in my whole life, but I really appreciated that you felt that that was such a part of your responsibility as well, not just to do the research, but to explain it in terms that all of us could understand. Well, that's really true. There's no point in having done this research if we can't communicate it to make a difference. And so it's critical that we take this information and turn it into something tangible. We turn it into a vaccine, we turn it into a treatment, and we turn it into policy, we turn it into informed decisions. Both my parents are teachers. Generations 100 years back in my entire family have been educated. It is our calling to try to bring up generations and explain the things that are being uncovered every day. And in immunology, it's the most exciting new area of science because it influences everything else. Every aspect of human disease, every aspect of whether you feel well enough to go to work has to do with human immunology. Thank you. Let me see. Next question here. Uh, Susan, what do you hope viewers will take away from the documentary? Susan, I think you're still muted. There you go. Okay. Um, one of the points, uh, in addition to the science that my colleagues quite eloquently talked about, their passion for understanding how the immune system works and use that knowledge to really improve human health, the component that I would like to um, the audience to take is International science is really critical. This global, we live in a very globalized society. And to prevent the next pandemic, we really need to have this mutually beneficial collaborations where we are trying to understand these diseases, how the immune system works, not just for infectious disease, for autoimmune disease, for cancer too, in different populations, because as I said, the immune system is shaped by multiple factors. By understanding in different populations, it helps everybody. So I'm advocating for a world, that's what I'm trying to do in my own ways, where we're establishing these collaborations with local scientists and we're tackling problems that affect not just that local country, but the entire world, including halfway across their country from Nepal, right here in San Diego. And I'm calling for a more um, mutually beneficial collaborations. Great, thanks, Susan. Mitch, how about you? What do you hope people take away from the documentary? Mute is the most common word in the English language now. Uh, I, I hope they um, can understand the beauty of an importance of understanding the immune response because it affects so many conditions and so many diseases. And because, like I said, although we different investigators here have their direction, infection or cancer or autoimmunity and inflammation, that it is one immune system. And um, 
somebody going in one direction may have a finding that impacts another direction. And we're all talking to each other. That's what's so unique about this place. And we built um, tools that really allow us to discover things in a, a unique way. For example, we built tools, Alex Sete in particular and Bjorn Peters, to find out what piece of the immune system is being recognized. Very important for vaccines. And it could be a vaccine, a therapeutic vaccine to prevent severe allergies or it could be a vaccine against infection. All these things are interrelated. And I hope people appreciate, appreciate that aspect of it while we're worrying about COVID-19, <laughs> as we all are. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch. And that leads to one other question um, that Mitch, you sort of touched on, but maybe Erica, you can talk a little bit more about, but how the different labs and specializations at LJI work together. You know, the remarkable thing about the immune system is how the different component parts work together, that there are some things that generally sense things, some that present things, and they inspire each other and they activate each other. The second remarkable thing about the immune system is its ability to respond to things it has never seen before. And so our immunology institute is very much like this. So echoing as Mitch said, we have experts on our faculty in every different area of immunology. We have VJ, who's a pulmonologist, who can understand the effect on the exacerbated lung disease. We have Ling Hedrick, who's one of the world's experts in macrophage, who can understand that aspect of the immune response for COVID-19. We have Sonia Sharma, who's doing individual functional metabolomics and genomics to understand that detailed level of response. Alex Sete broadly mapping, just as the world is becoming aware of the existence of the, epi uh, of the epidemic, what particular parts could be recognized and what similarities there might be with viruses we already knew. And so the beautiful thing that's here in this one building is all the different intellectual capacities and tools to understand the virus at the extreme molecular level, the cellular level, how finding the right antibodies will talk to the right T cell response and how you might craft a vaccine that's going to last more than a few months, right? We need vaccines that'll last several years. This is one of Shane Crotty's specialties, vaccine memory. We need vaccines that are going to work for lots of different kinds of populations, whether young people or elderly people, people here, people in developing nations. And so very much like the immune system itself, the collaborating and activating labs that flow into each other and speak to each other inform what we do. You know, my lab and Susan's lab, there are no walls between us. The people flow back and forth and we share tools and we share expertise and then my people talk to her team all day long. This is the, the beautiful thing about LJI and why we have been able to pivot so quickly to make such a rapid response against a novel virus. Thanks, Erica. I, I saw that firsthand, the different scientists and labs working together and it really was inspiring. Um, one more question for you, Mitch, and then we're gonna close it out for tonight. Um, but since we know that coronavirus affects men and women differently, is LJI studying these differences and do you focus on the cellular differences of men and women? Yes, well, thank you for that. So we know that men are more susceptible, uh, but we know that your sex has a big influence on the immune response. We know, for example, that autoimmune diseases are more prevalent in women. For lupus, it's about 90% are women. And we are planning to, uh, to do more research in this area. It's an understudied area. We do have studies that look at um, vasculitis and other diseases and the difference between men and women. And it's an area in which we're just at the stages of planning to do more. It's a place that we can really fit uh, a unique role. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to doing more work in that direction. Great, thanks Mitch. So I think Mitch is going to close us out, but uh, just a plug for the visionaries that uh, season 24, which includes LJI, has been released. So you can check your local listings for times and dates. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jody, for a beautiful film. The cinematography, the narration, uh, very, very, very fantastic. I really 
appreciate that. I appreciate everyone in the audience for staying with us, especially you in Massachusetts. It's getting a little late, I suppose. Um, the one thing I want to uh, tell the audience is that we've been able to do amazing things in COVID-19 research, and we've been able to do that because of private philanthropy. We rely predominantly on the U.S. government and the National Institute of Health, which funds our research. But those, that grant-making process generally is, is slower than philanthropic support. We need support now to do certain things, to finish building our biosafety level three facility, for expanding our clinical core so we can uh, take blood samples from more donors and do blood processing, for more instrumentation, uh, to finish recruiting uh, a young, very promising investigator for the, the needed startup package. We have a number of needs and educating is very important, as Erica said, communicating to the public is very important. And we, we want to do that regardless. But if people have the capacity and interest to support us, we hope they'll consider doing that. And there will be more information, uh, website connections that you'll see uh, after the video breaks here, where you can find out more information. So I hope people will do that. And thank you again for the video.